Uh, my name is Ben Dean. I'm a principal engineer at Blizzard and I work on Battle.net. Uh, among other things, that means I get paid to try and improve the quality of code. So this talk is really about my experiences, um, trying to make my code less likely to fail. Uh, please ask questions as we go. I have the slides numbered, although you can't see the numbers because it's chopped off. <laughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> so this talk covers a lot of kind of different areas and and things because I, I think tech progresses best when we can draw from a melting pot of techniques. Um, testing is <coughs> sort of well better established in other languages than in C++. Um, but here are the, some of the techniques I've discovered through uh, trying to get my code not to fail. And I really had to uh, tackle two problems. One is kind of working in the legacy code base and, and getting that to work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And the second big problem I had to cover was um, how do I gain confidence in my code being scalable? Because you know I'm working on a desktop machine and I'm deploying to uh, millions of users. I'm deploying to a system which is going to take millions of users. Um, I wanted to the, the problem I really wanted to solve was how to how to get confidence in my code before actually deploying it. So and I'll I'll be talking a little bit little bit about that and kind of uh, extended the side where that took me through property based testing and then the final result of that. <coughs> so Battle.net is a large kind of umbrella uh, within Blizzard. But the part I'm going to be talking about is the C++ part, because here I'm at C++ now. It's about 325,000 lines, uh, which, which actually isn't that much considering everything it does, I think. Um, but that's basically the backend servers, so the Battle.net cloud uh, that all game clients connect to and also the client DLL that we ship to uh, the game teams, so the, Warcraft, the World of Warcraft team, the StarCraft team, the Hearthstone team. <coughs> so within that Battle.net cloud, there's, there's uh, client-facing servers. There's also uh, kind of client-facing servers, kind of, but on the back end, because we consider uh, the servers that the game teams write to be clients of Battle.net, as well as you know, clients running on end-user machines. Uh, so we call this system Battle.net Game Service to kind of distinguish it within the big umbrella that is Battle.net. And it does, it does lots of things. Uh, among four, four of the things it does, four of the large tasks it does are authenticating players. So when you log in, you know, you prove your identity to Battle.net. It does a bunch of social things. So uh, extending friend invitations, accepting them, uh, sending chat to your friends, obtaining presence on your friends, so which game they're playing, uh, whether they're online or offline, you know, whether they're AFK, that's kind of uh, up to the second resolution presence. One of the large uh, computational tasks that Battle.net does is uh, matchmaking, so either cooperative or competitive matchmaking. Uh, that differs by game, obviously, so the StarCraft II matchmaking is very different from uh, the Hearthstone matchmaking is very different from the Diablo III matchmaking. And also Battle.net stores a bunch of uh, achievements and profiles, and it does all this stuff in a pretty game agnostic way. Um, <coughs> so the other point I want to make about Battle.net, kind of as an introductory point, is almost everything is asynchronous. So um, all of the, within the Battle.net cloud, a lot of functions end up going, uh, end up hopping between several servers, and so. From that point of view, every, almost every function call in Battle.net is asynchronous to a first approximation. Um, there's a lot of uh, varied architecture in there, so there's we, there's um, you know it's a it's a large enough project. It's not a huge project, but it's a large enough project that you find all kinds of code in there. So there's um, inheritance-based polymorphism. There's composition. There's some value semantic stuff. There's some, there's plenty of templates. Uh, there's some manual memory management, there's some smart pointer usage, um, and there's a lot of manual callback chaining, and there's also uh, some coroutine usage. Uh, one, of the, one of the places where the, one of the things Battle.net doesn't really do, which you might think it does, is it's not, it's not highly uh, data parallel, it's not highly multi-threaded. There's, there's function, uh, con function level <coughs> asynchronicity and concurrency, but there aren't a lot of problems that Battle.net solves that uh, benefit from data, from data level parallelism. <coughs> so, uh, a few years ago I found myself in a kind of familiar situation 
um, familiar for me in the games industry anyway. I was, I was in this project, there was plenty of legacy code. It's a large project that has lots of moving parts. Uh, but I have no practice at unit testing. Unit testing isn't part of my culture. It isn't part of the games industry culture historically. We could say it isn't part of C++ culture historically. Um, and now this, this project has <coughs> some mature lower level libraries, which are very well tested, and in some cases even have unit tests. But it also has a bunch of features. You know, my team is constantly trying to make new features, kind of being, kind of adding features at an alarming rate, uh, almost. And uh, you know, we needed some some solution to uh, you know not just relying on warm bodies in QA seats. <coughs> so it was they had some well tested stuff in there. So this is what I mean when I say mature low level libraries, and maybe this rings true for some of the code bases you've seen as well. So these are kind of easy mode for unit tests, right? These are things with well-defined inputs, well-defined outputs. You can, you know, for UTF-8 string conversion, you can download a bunch of tests. You don't have to think about edge cases yourself. And indeed, when I was, when I was copying over some code, when I was uh, shifting some code between one part of Valnet and another, I found, and I had to sort of retool some UTF-8 UTF code, I decided at that point to put unit tests in. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not actually going to write these tests, I'll just go find them online. And I did, and I applied them, and that turned up some bugs. So at that point, I thought, well, you know, unit testing has value. <coughs> so I started thinking, so all this stuff was in the code and fine. And we had probably in the project about 200 tests, right? Um, but this, we never, we never really touched this code once it's there. The tests aren't useful for all the new stuff we're adding. So I started thinking about, how can I tackle these kind of problems in the large that Balnet does? And I started to, uh, so I kind of went away for a month of, of commute time. I highly recommend having a long commute because it gives you a lot of time to think. <coughs> so I took about a month of commute time thinking about this. I read, you know, I read TDD books, I read Kent Beck, I read Bob Martin. I watched uh, talks by Mishko Haveri and people like that. And I came to the conclusion that um, the only reason I wasn't doing unit testing was that I wasn't practiced at it. Because as far as I could see, there was no real reason not to start. And, and if I wanted to you know, make an inroad on doing this stuff, I needed to start doing unit testing, and I needed to start doing TDD. <coughs> so our project had a kind of fledgling, uh, home-rolled unit testing framework, very similar to, I'm sure, many unit testing frameworks out there, very similar to uh, Google Test, very similar to um, unit test plus plus. It was just very bare bones, easy, no barrier to entry stuff. <coughs> so what I discovered was, and you know, part of this talk is to tell you guys that I, I'm not offering a magic bullet. Um, and I did it in, the, in at first, write a lot of mocks, and I set up a lot of data structures for testing um, these kind of things. Because these, these things started out with you know, huge kind of input spaces which was one of the problems I had to kind of whittle down. Um, so at first I wrote a lot of mocks, I wrote a lot of data structures. It ended up with a lot of testing code to keep bug free because you know you, you write your code and you write your tests and your tests are also code and so you have to keep your tests debugged. Uh, but along the way I did find some better code structures and some useful techniques. <coughs> so let's talk about uh, problem one, testing large legacy classes. Now, Balnet as a whole is fairly well architected, I would say. Um, but in any code base that size, you have legacy code. There are things that get larger, there are things that do complex things, and I need to test them. Uh, so well architected is not the same as easy to test, <coughs> unfortunately. So uh, I'm going to cover a couple of examples straight from Balnet. Uh, header file to show you the kind of thing I talk, the kind of thing I mean uh, with regard to classes being easy to test. So here's Exhibit A. Uh, so this is a this is a class that implements a presence channel. So this is uh, the object that kind of shuttles around presence updates. So when people come online, offline, when they when they start playing a different game, that kind of thing. Um, and right away you can see that it's an inheritance hierarchy that's what four levels deep. And more than that, the bottom, the bottom level, you can see that there's an RPC implementer there. So 
the thing that implements the logic of the presence channel is already mixing concerns with the RPC handling stuff at, at the bottom level. And there's a protocol dependency, right, because of that also. So, that, I mean, this is, this is kind of a traditional interface implementation hierarchy, at least in my corner of the world. Um, but, but the fact that you've got implementation, the fact you've got the RPC in there, the protocol in there, you're mixing concerns, it's not that easy to test. And if you look at the constructor here, well, it's got six arguments, which already is kind of a lot. But moreover, some of these constructor arguments have a really wide interface. Um, there's an RPC dispatcher, and there's these two things. Channel delegate is a thing that um, kind of embodies permissions on the channel. So it has an interface to say, uh, when, you know, when, when an action happens, is the person allowed to send a message in this channel? Is he allowed to see this data kind of thing? And the, the config field map for presence defines you know, how the presence fields propagate and to whom. So these are, large, these are large things. These are basically, they could be tested, but they're really onerous to mock. Right? So this constructor, it does dependency inject these things. But because they're so large, they're really onerous to mock. There's a lot of configuration to set up. <coughs> so here's another example, the achievement service. Now the achievement service is actually pretty well tested, so picking on it is almost not fair. But you know, there's always room for improvement. Again, it derives from um, the the BNet achievements achievement service is a thing that does RPC, uh, implements the RPC protocol, and then there's this achievement service static data loader, which implies some kind of I/O might happen in the in the constructor, right? And then if you look in the constructor. Well, it's hard to imagine something with a wider interface than the MySQL database. <laughs> <coughs> so again, we have dependency injection going on, which, which you know, all of, the, all of the textbooks on testing say dependency injection is the thing, right? But, even, but it doesn't really help if the, if the API is so wide as to be very difficult to mock. Um, server helper here is sort of another code smell that I that I uncovered. So as we were writing more and more of these kind of uh, interfaces, these, these implementations of RPC stuff, we found that we were duplicating a lot of code. And so what did we do? We factored it into this thing called server helper. And server helper kind of legitimizes this idea of mixing I.O. and mixing concerns at this level. And this constructor has 12 arguments. <laughs> so. You know, this, this code actually works. It's shipped. It does a job. So I don't want to malign it too much. But it's just, it's not easy to test. And so this is what I started, started working with. <coughs> so in hindsight, maybe server help was a, little, was a mistake from the point of view of testability. So <sighs> these are some patterns that, that we know are inimical to testing, right? So lack of dependency injection, that's what all the textbook says. Doing work in constructors is really a problem. Um, and so RAII is almost an enemy of testing, right? Because you don't want to do that in the thing you're testing very much. You don't actually want testable things to, to grab resources. Uh, and you don't really want wide interfaces, uh, especially to your constructors, because that's just going to make it onerous to mock. So how did I go about teasing this apart? Well. I had to think about this. And like I said, this is a traditional kind of interface and impool class hierarchy. So I started thinking, well, one of the things, one of the interesting parts of um, one of the talks I saw was, um, I think Mishko Hevery uh, drew a distinction between there are parts of your code that um, do computation, and then there are parts of your code that wire objects together. And that's, that's a key distinction for testing. So I started thinking about that and how to apply that to this. And so this very simplistic UML diagram um, I, I decided to make my razor um, separating logic, so separating computation from everything else interaction-wise. So that the, the, and I could pull something out of a base class where I had the class hierarchy and make the base class do the logic rather than doing the normal way of saying interface and then the implementation is within a derived class. I put the logic implementation in the base class and push down all the, all the interactions in the derived class. And so that way hopefully I can test uh, the base class because it's just doing computation, it's just doing maths at that point. It's not doing I.O., it's not doing anything hard to test. 
So the good news is um, this is actually applicable. Um, and, it can, and like I said, in BattleNet, we've got this uh, interface. Uh, we've got this hierarchy. We've also got plenty of compositional patterns. So this, this pattern applies to, uh, to one as it does to the other. In the case of a compositional pattern, it's the entity or the object class that I could push all the I.O. or the configuration into, and the component class contains the logic. So here's an example of that in action. So queuing for games. So the game queuing system is moderately complicated. It has to deal with, so the obvious thing it has to deal with is players come in, they want to get a game of, say, Diablo 3. There isn't enough server capacity to put them in a game. Right? So th that's, that's the obvious thing you think of when queuing for games. There's a few more uh, nuances in there. Um, it had to deal with, um, so, so game, the game player population is segmented by game type, for one thing, and all the servers might not serve all of the game types. Uh, what good, one good example of that is uh, hardcore mode. So it, hardcore mode is with permanent character death versus non-permanent. Um, another thing that the queuing system has to take account of, we, we suspected that when we launched uh, in Taiwan and Korea, there was a lo relatively low bandwidth link between those two countries. And so we thought that players in Taiwan using the Korea data center might for reasons of uh, you know, uh, game goodness, we might have to kind of back off on how many players from Korea, uh, from Taiwan we could accept because they wouldn't get good latency, they wouldn't get a good game experience. Um, in the end, that turned out not to be the case, but it did complicate the queuing system at launch. Uh, but the other thing the queuing system has to do is actually, as well as just gating the kind of uh, absolute load on the servers, it has to gate the rate of game creation. So even when the servers are not fully loaded, um, the queuing system serves to kind of gate the rate of that we push the games to the servers because actually starting up a game is a load, uh, a quite a different load uh, profile. It's more spiky than keeping a game running steady state. Anyway, all that explained. <coughs> Here's game queue base. So the first thing to notice is it doesn't derive from anything, right? So that's good. Uh, its constructor has a very small interface. Now, there are five arguments, but four of them are just callbacks, so minimal interface uh, width. Um, and the server pool interface is, is just something that supports kind of querying of server load, finding a server that's unloaded. So that's a fairly small interface. And then, as far as queuing, it just implements queuing logic. It just does exactly what you expect a queue to do. There's nothing here to say, do RPC, deal with I.O., you know, figure that stuff out, pretty much. A queue is a queue is a queue. So that's in GameQ base. And then GameQ impl derives from that. And it deals with all the other interactions. So it derives from GameQ base. It derives from the protocol. So it implements protocol handling functions that the clients or the, 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 cl the clients of that protocol call, I guess, is actually another server within Balnet that's, that's, that's a client of this. Uh, it deals with system events. So kind of process-wide system events, initialization, shutdown, etc. Uh, it deals with, so when the, one of the interactions it has with the base is injecting configuration. <coughs> and so it deals with reading the configuration, uh, you know, from the configuration repository, handling all that, and then injecting it. Now, the interesting point here is that um, once you've, configuration, you know, as was said this morning, can be large, but I found that once I'd separated kind of the base into just this thing which is doing computation, the configuration for that becomes much, much smaller. And in particular, you can give it reasonable defaults. Like if your configuration is saying this server address and, and all this other stuff to do with I.O., it's, it's much more difficult to, to give reasonable defaults to that than it is to give defaults to just a computational thing, where you can say some nominal figures, basically, just some numbers. Uh, and then the game queue impl deals with you know other stuff. <coughs> so here's another example uh, for matchmaking. This is a co this is a compositional example. So the game fact I should explain a little bit about game game factory, <coughs> as its name suggests, creates games. The game master impl is the thing that is responsible for doing RPC of um, joining games, finding games, you know, dropping players into and out of games basically, and it uses factories. <coughs> 
uh, to achieve that task. So the factory is a thing that contains matchmaking logic. There are different factories for different game types, which implement different matchmaking strategies. Um, uh, and again, the game factory is a thing that I tried to push all the logic and none of the interaction into. And the game master impulse just serves as a kind of broker for all that interaction. <coughs> so game factory, again, derives from nothing. Uh, very small uh, constructor interface. So pretty much just a version. The program ID would be Diablo 3 or, Warcraft, or World of Warcraft or Starcraft and an ID. It has a call to configure it. Again, this gets pushed in from uh, the game master and pull. And there's not much configuration once you've separated you know, all, the, all the logic. You can pick reasonable defaults again. And it does exactly what you'd expect um, a matchmaking thing to do. So it can register players for matchmaking, unregister them, and have people join the game directly. <coughs> and not much else. <coughs> and then the game master in pull is the thing that deals with interactions. So, and here they all are again. So system events, again, this is, uh, this is basically what the, uh, taking a place of configuration. So in response to a, a game server connecting and, and saying, hey, I know how to serve these types of games, this will then match up what game factories uh, correspond to that. Timo. I've got a question. So yeah. I think you're using inheritance. Wouldn't this composition work just as well? So that the code that right now is in the base class is a member of the RPC class. Right. That, uh, that, is, that is true for this example. So ga mm -hmm. game, game Master Impulse doesn't derive from Game Factory. But it, it owns ah, but it, it owns a bunch of game factories. So, so the queue was yeah. We have you know we have several. <coughs> we have lots of patterns in in Balnet, and we have inheritance code as well as the request. The question, sorry, <laughs> the question was, um, wouldn't uh, this is showing inheritance? Wouldn't it work for composition as well? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, and I'm 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 trying to show both sides. So f for Game Master Impl, it, it uses composition indeed. Um, so Instantiate Factories, as I said, is kind of the configuration thing. And then these are the RPC uh, type things. So what players can do. They can list factories, they can join games, etc., etc. OK, so this, it turned out, was a successful pattern. And it allowed me to decouple logic from other concerns. Um, and you know. All the testing guys who beat the drum of dependency injection are right. And in this case, it was uh, config that, that, that turned out that way. And I was able to make the logic testable with, with sensible defaults. And I could even apply it to fairly monolithic classes, because I could, tr I could try and pull something. Basically, when you've got a chain of inheritance, you can either pull something out of the bottom or out of the top. In this case, I could pull it out of the top as a base class. And it's always the case that some testing beats no testing. So <coughs> that was good. So that was kind of uh, almost a disjoint part of this talk. Um, so yeah, so the observation is that, um, again, dependency injection is kind of what you want for testable code at all. But even with dependency injection, you want very small constructor interfaces. You want narrow narrow interfaces, otherwise they're just onerous to test. <coughs> so that was kind of problem one of working in a legacy code base. So then I came to the problem of um, how do I gain confidence in my code's ability to scale? Because um, I really don't want to get woken up at 3 AM. I have been several times. Um, so. I made this observation. So depending on the size of your data set, you have fundamentally different solutions. So in a lot of shrink-wrapped games, they're dealing with data sets in the thousands. And when you have a data set that's just in the thousands, you pretty much, it almost doesn't matter what algorithm you use. You just use a vector, and you make sure everything's cache friendly, and you get decent performance. On the other end of the scale completely, which, which Balnet is not at also. When you're working with things in the billions, uh, like a Facebook or a Google or something, you, you have to be correct almost by construction. And, and your 
you know, you have a cluster from day one, so your, your algorithms don't actually run on a single machine. <coughs> now, Balanet's working sets are in the millions, which is this kind of halfway house, and the problems are totally amenable to being solved on one machine, because, you know, we've got machines in the data center that have tens of gigabytes of RAM. It's very easy to have data structures of a couple of million things, right? So, Data structures are still really important to performance because caching concerns, etc., can easily get you two orders of magnitude. But they can't really get you five orders of magnitude, right? There's still, there's still the importance of efficiency of algorithm. You still cannot afford a log n algorithm. Uh, you, ca you cannot afford an order n algorithm where you should have a log n algorithm. So my first thought was, well, I'll, I'll, I'll time some tests, because timing is easy. And they are easy, but they're not, they're not so useful. Because my machine actually is quite different to a production machine. You know, I've got a Windows desktop, and I'm running on a CentOS Blade in production. I can use time tests for optimizing to a certain degree, um, and I do. But they can't, time tests can't tell me if my code is fast enough in an absolute sense. You know, I still can't generate this input of a million and figure out that I can, I can do that in time. Um, the other concern I had about this <coughs> was that efficiency is super easy to lose, right? So I can, I can craft a data structure and an algorithm and I can, you know, craft a solution to matchmaking and it's all in my head for that week that I do it and then I check it in and then later on, you know, we're adding some other feature. Maybe it's me, maybe it's some other engineer. Um, they're all good guys, but we're all human. And it's very easy to miss in a code review something that accidentally turns a log n algorithm into an order n algorithm. And so I started to think about a way to test for algorithmic efficiency. Because I want, you know, I want the computer to enforce everything it can enforce. I want the computer to, I basically want the compiler to be omnipotent. And you know, by compiler, I, I mean in an extended way, all the tools that I run on my code. And so, I, in my in my hour-long commute each way, each day, I was thinking about this, and I hit upon this idea that seemed simple, um, but seemed promising, which I hadn't really heard of before. But obviously, you know, I'm not hubristic enough to think that nobody's done this, but. I thought, well, if I run the same test with different size inputs, it's going to take a different amount of time, obviously, right? So let's say I have an order n algorithm, and I run it on the input of size n, it takes some time, and then I multiply up that size input, it takes some other time. So uh, an easy bit of math, kind of, and, I, and I'm dropping the, you know, the, the smaller terms after order n, which is a simplification, but I went with this. Uh, I thought, well, I can actually time it twice with these two different inputs, divide through, and that should tell me, shouldn't it, that it, basically whether I'm order n or log n or whatever. So having thought of this, it seemed kind of promising. You know, there were, there were some implementation things I would probably have to work out on the way. Um, but I did, I did back of the envelope calculations. I, you know, I did some back of the envelope algebra for this, and I figured out the buckets that I care about, basically. So, and really the, the big distinction I cared, I cared about was the difference between order n and order log n, because that was kind of my, my break point. Like when I'm writing a matchmaking algorithm that has to deal with matching a player into potentially millions of open games, I cannot be log n. I, I cannot be order n. I can be order log n. You know, doing, doing 20 or 30 uh, comparisons isn't going to break the bank. But doing a million of them or two million of them, that's bad. So, so, you know, here's my kind of back of the envelope buckets that I started to think about. <coughs> so, it, it sounds easy when I put it that way, but as we all know, timing is difficult. Um, it's sensitive to things like machine load. It's sensitive to caching effects. You know, the second time you run something might be faster because, you know, particularly if the OS has cached something uh, in, in the file system or something like that. Um, and it's in particularly sensitive to the, time, the granularity of the timing function. So at the time, 
uh, I, I used RDTSC. I didn't have a, a standard uh, cheap to call high resolution timer at the time. Um, but I was able to, you know, so tests are all about gaining confidence. And it doesn't have to be perfect to be good enough, right? So I could write this kind of code. And for my algorithms, I had to have a somewhat careful choice of, you know, how many, what size input to give it versus what size input to give it for the second run, because I want it to be fast enough that it can run in a couple of seconds, uh, you know, but not, but, but uh, enough input to kind of elucidate the, the true meaning of the, the algorithmic uh, complexity. And I did some statistical mitigation, so uh, just to try and provide a very simple guard against things like uh, caching effects and machine load. So I think I ran it like, I set up the framework to run it like five times and discard the outliers or something like that. So <coughs> my next problem was how to get different size inputs to my test. Remember, I'm working in this kind of monolithic class system. Um, and the first thing I did was just let the test itself make them, because the test knows everything about what it's testing. And this works. And this actually was something I shipped with, because it did the job. You know, good enough is good enough. So here I say, uh, you know, run the test once. And, and the test internally to it knows how to set up its data structure, so this size n. And then it runs the test, and it times it, and it returns the time. So here's you know, test, one run, uh, uh, test run one and test run two. <coughs> and this was fine. It worked well enough, but it really bloated my tests. Because putting all this stuff in the test also meant that I had, you know, I had to generate stuff. It resulted in about, you know, 80% of the test was not the actual test. It was the code to generate the data structures. It was the code to do timing. It was the, the whatever. And, and of course, the timing had to be not part of the generation. So that was a potential source of bug in the test, right? right if it was naively done. Um, but you know, sometimes good enough is good enough, and this was good enough to ship. This certainly gave me confidence uh, in my code. So when we shipped Diablo 3, I was confident that it wouldn't blow up when a million players came to do matchmaking. Uh, and you know, that, that's, a, that's a possibility. You know, so one of the things we also do, um, kind of tangentially to this, is when you're building a system this size, you have to plan for failure. Like failure, you have to think of failure as an everyday occurrence. And what do you do when you fail? And, and how do you get back to the status quo after you fail? And so we do plan for things like, you know, a server goes down or a bunch of servers go down, and then a million players want to come back within the space of five minutes. So this, this really can happen. Um, so yeah, I lived with this for a while, but, but I'm lazy. And uh, I'm also a student of other languages. And um, in particular, I'm a student of uh, Haskell. And Haskell has this library called QuickCheck, which is, which is magic. And QuickCheck can, can generate inputs to your functions and uh, call you with random inputs. And so I started thinking about generating my input, because I was generating my input manually right now. I started thinking about this idea of property-based testing, which I'd heard about from Haskell. And it's, I think, more established now in languages, particularly that have reflection. The idea is that uh, you write a function that embodies some invariant of your algorithm. And then the testing framework will generate random inputs for you and call your function with all these random inputs. And whatever you've asserted in there should be true for any input. So I need a generation of inputs, right? So I decided to think about this. So because I've been doing TDD, because I've been uh, you know, studying testing, a big part of TDD is doing kind of wish-driven development, where you just, you just write the code that you wish existed. So what I had was uh, this very simple unit testing framework where I define a test just like this. Uh, and what I wanted to have was some kind of way of, a, a way of writing it just like this, where I'd write it just like, just like a function that would take something 
and then I would do something to assert my invariant for that algorithm. <coughs> so to do this, I need a way to generate values of any type. Now there are lots of things that we already do for any type, or and practically any type. Things like stream output operators exist for many, many types. And so, of course, that gave me the idea of turning to templates. <coughs> now again, uh, I take all of my best ideas come from Haskell a lot of times. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Haskell <coughs> Haskell's quick check library uh, uses arbitrary as its name, so uh, I started playing with um, the idea of um, arbitrary and this idea that you can generate um, things of type T. So the function signature to generate here it takes takes two arguments, one of which is some idea of the generation, so some idea of the complexity of the thing we're generating, and then a random seed so that I can plumb it through again in the future and get a reproducible result. <coughs> So, you know, once I have this function signature, then I can start specializing it. Um, <coughs> so it's easy to write for arithmetic types. Uh, what I did was just um, take that generation parameter, and uh, if it's 0, 1, or 2, I front load the edge cases that are likely to trigger uh, test failures. So the obvious ones are 0 and the, and the limits. Um, and then after that, just use a uniform distribution over the range of the data type. <coughs> and then once I have arithmetic types, or you know, uh, ints, floats, bools, things like that, they're all fairly trivial. Um, then I can start. Well, here's, sorry, here's the code for that. So you can see that um, the first, when g comes in as zero, one, or two, uh, I front load the edge cases. <coughs> and then, and then I just return a random number. Now, before someone points out this, this, this code is formatted for slides. I don't really create a Mersenne twister every time in the function. That's actually squirreled away somewhere else. Um, but yeah, so that's it. That's for int-like types. So that's that's easy, right? So once you've got it for int-like types, and and by the way, for chars, I I think I constrain it to generate printable values. So once I'd done that, then I could extend to uh, compound data types, so vectors, strings, etc., and uh, apply this sort of algebraic data type kind of approach. So for vectors and strings, the call to generate works in terms of generating on the underlying contained type. So for compound types, it looks something like this. Uh, the, the generation I just have this uh, idea of um, the generation says how complex the thing is. So in terms of a vector or a string, it's how long <coughs> the, the string is or how long the vector is. And arbitrarily, every 100 generations, I just say the first 100 are 10, the second 100 are 20 long, third 100 30 long, etc. Um, and then it calls generate in terms of the underlying data structure, it, it, and it generates n of them in a vector, and it returns the vector. So, you know, I could build this up recursively, having underlying types and then doing it for all the, the compound types. So, now we come back to this. So, so now I know how to generate strings and things using this, using this template. So, how do I plumb it through with this, this macro? <coughs> now, a property, what this, actu what this macro actually expands to is uh, it generates a some kind of nonce named struct, which has operator paren, and you know the 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 argument that I said the macro would take becomes the argument to the operator paren, and then the body of the property becomes the body of the operator paren. So now I know how to generate these things. What I need to do here is figure out figure out what type of thing to generate, and I d and I. You know, this, this process was a, a process of kind of going through, knocking down each barrier in turn. In this case, it was just a case of using a simple function traits template, and this is very simple. Um, you can Google it and find almost something exactly the same. So 
the operator paren on the class gets passed into the, uh, or the class gets passed into function traits, and that takes apart the operator paren, which, which inherits from this thing, which ends up defining archetype. So I can pull archetype out of, out of the, the class, the property class. Once I have that, <coughs> then I need to uh, take this operator paren function, and it, it's a certain type, and what I need to do with it is basically jam it into the run function for the test. Um, and I do that using type erasure, because anytime you have like a, a, a varying type object which has a very small interface and you want to call it uh, in, a, in a standard way, it seems like type erasure is a good thing to consider, or it seemed to me at the time. So th this is the property which derives from test. Uh, it implements run by um, creating a property, which is, and then property is the type erase thing, right? Property is the thing that type erases and discovers the argument type, and then implements this check function, which will do the right thing. <coughs> so, the property itself is uh, a very simple type arrays uh, pattern. Um, it just takes, you know, its constructor is, is a template, like you would expect, and it squirrels away the thing internally in, in a pointer, and then the the base class contained exposes this check function. So then inside internal base it obviously knows what type of thing <coughs> it knows the uh, it can it can recover the argument type. Uh, yeah. Inside the internal class this is inside inside the internal class is checked. So it can recover the argument type from the function traits. It can use arbitrary to generate that argument and it can call the test with that with that uh, argument. And the omitted uh, procedure calls, the omitted uh, arguments here are things like uh, just the plumbing through of the random seed and things like that. Any questions? Cool. Okay, so, um, right. So just to see that in action, Uh, I'm not going to subject you to my typing. I have something I've made earlier. So here's a property that takes, like we just saw in the code, it takes, like we just saw, uh, it takes a const string, and you know this doesn't actually check check anything. I'm just going to print it out just to just so you can be sure that uh, it's actually working. Uh, okay, and I'll just do verbose. So. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to give it num checks uh, 200. So remember, the first 100 will be size 10 strings. The second 100 will be size 20 strings. <coughs> so there we can see what this is. What, wait. So there's the size 20 strings. There's the size 10 strings. They were just generated and printed out by that test function. So far, so good. Yeah. And then with the writing string algorithms, I found that the empty string often broke my implementation. So yes. Why? Yeah. I guess it's I, um, no, it's still a to do, um, <coughs> but uh, and it's one of those things that I noticed again last night. But I'm like, I'm not going to change it now because. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but yeah, yeah no, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> yes. Oh. I I totally agree. The empty string often breaks things. Um, so, so this is cool. So now I have the, the ability to generate things to pass to my algorithmic tests. Um, but before I sort of come out of this rabbit hole and, and go down that one, um, there's another thing, of course, that, that, that arbitrary can handle, and that is, um, oh, well, here's just a, sorry, before I get to that, this is just a recap. So the macro expands the non-struct, the property type erases it, and then the check uses the function traits to pull out the argument type. Then we generate it, and we call through, and we plumb through the random seeds. So the other thing that I can do with arbitrary is try and find the minimal fail case, right? So when you find a case that fails, uh, particularly if it's a compound data type, it's less true for arithmetic data types, perhaps. But if, when you find a, a, a string that fails, for example, you want to be able to shrink it and find the minimal fail case. And so 
this function shrink, it takes a t and returns a vector of, in some way, reduced t's. Uh, and the way it does that, for example, for string, is a simple kind of binary chop. So shrink for strings just takes in a string, and you know that here's the base case for the kind of recursion, um, but it chops it in half, and that's all it does, and it puts a, makes a vector of two half strings <coughs> and returns, and then the machinery will call the test on those two half strings and kind of recurse down the, the side that uh, leads to the minimal failure. So I can show you that working. Uh, again, I'm not going to... I'm not going to subject you to my live coding, but um, I am going to show you uh, the code. Uh, and you probably want that blown up a bit. So here's a very simple check. There's a property, and it fails if there's an A in the string, right? Everyone can see that. It's just the simplest thing I could think of. Sorry? So yeah, if, it, if a string is found, so if it's not equal to the end, it returns uh, false, right? <coughs> so if I run that now, I'll just make it generate 10 characters. Now, there's a chance when I run this, it might not generate any strings with A in, in which case you'll see that. But there, it generated the string with an A, and it shows you how it, you can see how it chopped it down. <coughs> so, oh, I'm sorry, you can't see the last line of this, but I guess it's okay because it's just a prompt. <laughs> you can see all the important stuff. Uh, so, yeah, so you can see that there's a 10 character string, and it failed because it contained an A, and then the shrink chopped it down, and it followed that branch. And it continually did that until it ended up failing with just the A. So that, that seems useful. All right. So now I have the ability to do this. I can go back to my algorithmic tests, and I can delete some code, which I like to do. So. <coughs> For an algorithmic test, remember for arbitrary we have this generate call and it has some fuzzy notion. So it's generating strings of length 10 and 20, etc. But for an algorithmic test, you need the ability to generate a string of length n, not where n means 10 or 20 or whatever. And so that's fairly easily done. Rather than, rather than computing the size from the generation here and calling generate, I just provide another function almost exactly the same, just called generate n. Uh, where it uses the generation directly. And so that can fit right into the algorithmic tests. So instead of, instead of passing n into the call to std generate n, it passes in g directly, right? And it recurses on generate n called on the contained type. So this tighter form of generate. <coughs> so, okay, so here's a sample, here's a very simple complexity test. So um, test name and tweet and whatever, and then I say it's got, this has got to be order n, right? And it takes this thing which is generated, uh, and, and it does something that better be order n. In this case, the simplest thing I can think of was max element. So given this, I can specialize my own types for arbitrary, which are mostly easily because, because I have the ability to specialize all the underlying types. <coughs> and it's much less boilerplate to maintain in my tests. So I'm going to show you an example of that. Uh, let me just grab that. Good. Uh, buffer. Yes. Oh, it makes me blow it up every time. So here's the complexity property. Um, so I'm actually going to. So this is order n, right? I'm going to. I'm going to let it run order n once. Uh, and we'll see that it says that passed. But then I'm going to change it to say all the log n. Okay, so the test passed. <coughs> now if I change it to log n, which it obviously isn't log n, and save that and compile. Now it failed. Now the, now the machinery did its work. So 
uh, it was expected to be, I said this is log n and it was actually order n. And this is what I want, right? This is, this is exactly what I want. So the result of that is that here's kind of before and after on some code. Now this is, obviously you can't read this, but it gives you an idea of the size of the test code. So this is about 80 lines, 80 and a bit lines, which represented, uh, this is a real uh, test from the co-op matchmaking factory. Um, and this has code in there to generate stuff and uh, you know timing and all that stuff. So on the left side, we have the before and the right side, the after. So straight away, I can take out the generation code. So all the code to do generation comes out. Uh, the timing code, that comes out too. It's a little less, but it comes out there. And then with what's left, some of it now becomes unnecessary because of the machinery doing this. And so that gets removed too. So this is, a, a, a kind of gives you an idea of how it cuts down, how it cut down my problem space. 80 lines becomes about 20 lines. <coughs> so, now of course the rule for good work is more work. So, people are never satisfied, and rightly, you know, I, so, <coughs> the thing I have to say, so I sometimes ride a unicycle around the office, and whenever people see me riding, they, they, they just say to me, the first thing I say is, oh, can you juggle as well while you're doing that? I'm like, do you know how long it took to learn how to do this? So, anyway. <laughs> so, so here's where I am now. Um, as we said before, dependency injection and really cutting down the working constructors helps a lot with testing. Um, this pattern I have for separating logic out the bottom of the class hierarchy or, or out of the compositional uh, hierarchy uh, works pretty well. Of course, I have regular unit tests for when I know my, my edge cases, um, for my normal kind of stuff. I have time tests when I'm optimizing, and then I have these property-based and algorithmic tests um, for, my, for my scalability confidence, which is nice. And in practice, like I said, it usually boils down to, uh, is your algorithm order log n or is it order n? Right, that's, in, in my world, that's the kind of gating factor of whether an algorithm can cut it in production. Uh, property tests make you think a lot harder than regular tests, it's true. Uh, but hopefully you only have to think hard once. Um, so I have some ideas for the future also. Uh, arbitrary is really close to fuzz testing. And so right now it's basically fuzz testing for algorithms, but it could equally be fuzz testing for you know, protocols. Um, and something that struck me is that when you're doing, when you're generating an arbitrary value uh, for, your, for your product type, for your, for your struct, um, you're basically doing a walk through the, through the space inhabited by the members of that struct. So the, if the struct has n members, it's an n-dimensional search space that you're kind of traversing. And it being a traversal space, you could do that in several ways. I haven't really looked into this yet, but it seems like it might be useful. Something else that came up at work was, um, at, at the moment, I'm doing the property-based generation, but it's also really useful for actually capturing any kind of uh, pathological cases that might come up in testing. So anytime you generate a poorly performing data set in the 99th percentile, you want to actually know about that, right? And that's a good thing to, to, to regenerate. Yeah, Marshall. Yeah, the, um, you talked about fuzz testing there. Um, in the last year, there have been a lot of interesting developments in that. Are you familiar with, let's say, American Fuzzy Lot? Yes, I, I, I've heard about it. I, so the question was, um, the comment was, uh, in the last year there have been a lot of good developments, uh, interesting developments in the realm of fuzz testing. Uh, American Fuzzy Lop was mentioned. Uh, it's something I have heard about, but not really uh, looked at in depth. Um, <coughs> yeah, so yeah, thanks, Marshall. No, no interest in hijacking your business. Oh, no, no. But you guys have... People have questions about AFL, they can come talk to me. Okay, cool. So if you have questions about American Fuzzy Lot, talk to Marshall. Um, funnily, I was expecting a lot more questions from the C++ Now crowd. When I gave this talk at work, they were a harsher crowd even. <coughs> so uh, the bottom line is that I'm still lazy and I still want the computer to do more for me. And I'm still human and I don't want to... Uh, I, I, make, I make mistakes, so I want the computer to call me out on that. 
So BattleNet is still all these things, uh, but more parts of it are well tested. And because I have tests, I'm much more confident changing code. And that's kind of what it's about for me as a selfish programmer. <coughs> so um, I have an appendix that I could go on to. Thanks for listening so far, but we have some time left, and I was expecting more questions. Um, so there, are there any questions at this point? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, can I give a specific example of a bug I found while I was implementing the testing? And like the range testing specifically, that, I mean, you know, the, uh, I can't think of a specific, I can't give you chapter and verse on a specific example, um, but Timo's observation that empty strings often break things, I'm sure I found a something that broke with an empty string, something that broke when it was given a negative number, um, very common. Um, all this stuff I really did, I should point out that BattleNet is very well tested in a, in a system integration test sense. In fact, um, we have a, a corporate GitHub appliance, and if you look on there, um, it thinks that BattleNet is written in C Sharp, because the test team I've written so, wrapped it in C sharp and written so many tests that it, that code actually outweighs the C++. Um, so so BattleNet is well tested from the point of view of system testing. Um, but I wrote this stuff from the point of view of, you know, I don't want to spin up, uh, I obviously can't spin up a million clients. I don't want to, the system test, the system test light takes probably 20 minutes and the system test overnight takes 90 minutes. So I don't want to be running that every compile. So. A lot of this comes from me being a selfish programmer and wanting to do things, you know, just for me, <laughs> so that I can gain confidence. Uh, there was a question. Yeah, Hinan. Um, double question, actually. So, um, can you test? Um, well, first of all, when you're, if I were designing uh, a class from scratch, and I liked your separation of logic and the I/O and like that, which do you think is better, inheritance or composition? So the question is, which do I think is better, inheritance or composition? Isn't that like a holy war? I, don't, um, uh, I can tell you that in my, in my own code and the code bases I've worked, the, 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 the uh, pendulum has swung heavily to composition in the last 10 years. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say probably composition at this point. Yes, so the question is, um, can, can this also be turned to, so algorithmic testing for speed can also be done for space. Um, yes, potentially. Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. It, it turns out that space testing, having tried to do it, is hard because of how the memory allocator works. And you have to usually allocate a lot of memory before you can really change the test. Right, so right. So the comment is that testing for space requires oodles of memory uh, and uh, <laughs> is, very, is very dependent on your allocator. Right. You, yes, you need an allocator that tells you, gives you chapter and verse on allocations. So, so you, you can presumably do this with Google Perf tools and TC malloc. Um, if your unit test is like, you're only really all allocating memory for the unit test part, and you just replace malloc under the hood and TC malloc and Google Perf tools will tell you everything you need to know. Yeah, that's what we do. That's, yeah. that's exactly what we need. OK, so apparently this can be done with Google Perf tools and TC malloc. Uh, Timo, I think you were first. So referring back to the question, so I also wonder how many real test cases you find with the random input. I love the way that you generate the performance, that you measure the performance. And I did something similar, so I had a storage code, and I wrote something that mimicked with randomness use cases. And I wanted to find right. out about the performance. And because I didn't pay much attention to the generation of the input, I found border cases. So it also generated border cases, right. but the general case worked, so I can see the duality in that. 
but I doubt that you find many interesting things with the <coughs> random strings. Right. The comment was that um, randomizing strings probably doesn't find much interesting. And it, it, it's most likely true. Uh, the random strings were an easy kind of thing, mechanism to use for slides. There was a question here before. Uh, I just wondered if you had, um, in your bonus slide set, if you had any uh, further examples of uh, uh, verifying that your class of variance were holding that sort of thing. Uh, so do I have in my bonus slides any further examples of class invariance? Not specifically. I go more into um, generate. I go more, actually, the bonus slides contain stuff about tuples and generating multiple argument functions, which was, I found, thought was quite interesting, C++ to share with this group. Chandler? I, I just wanted to say the way that AFL and other fuzzers are causing random strings to be effective is by using coverage-directed evolution <coughs> of the random string so that it will evolve to find the structure of the actual program. Right. Yes, that's, that's cool. Um, so the comment was uh, AFL and other fuzzers use coverage-directed uh, information to refine their idea of uh, what will be an effective input. So specifically, that makes random strings. Uh, specifically for random strings. Yeah, they, okay. much more effective than you naively expect. You actually find the interesting edge cases. With right. OK. That's useful to know. Ahmed. At some point, you mentioned a, having a validator to make sure that the input was valid. But you didn't show an example of that? At some point, I mentioned having a validator. Basically testing to make sure that the input was valid for, like that you're not passing input that's not in the domain of the function that you're testing. Because if you generate a random string, the, the random string Oh, uh, I don't think I covered that, but I have got that same question when I've, when I've shared this with people at work. So, so yeah, the question arises, um, I have a function that takes an int, but in reality in my production code, I know that this int is going to be no, never any bigger than, let's say, 32. How do I tool my testing to generate me ints in that range only. And uh, the answer in C++ is really involves some boilerplate. I think you, one way I would do it is just make a struct just containing an int and constrain, the, you know, constrain that struct, uh, basically make a new type and, and uh, provide arbitrary for that type which only generates in that range. Uh, do something like that. But, um, in general, it's not easy to do without boilerplate. It can be done like that. I don't know of particularly another way to do it. Yeah. So I was wondering, as you get more and more into this testing and, and um, trying to find these counterfeits, have you gone so far as to write reference implementations for complex algorithms? So if you have a complex search algorithm, you actually stick it in a list and then randomly apply to both and compare it? Yeah, so the question was, um, as testing gets more complicated, have, have I tried um, writing or comparing a, a tricksy algorithm with a naive but safe algorithm, I guess is the spirit of the question. Um, yes, I have done that. Um, that's something I first read about, I think, in Code Complete uh, a dozen years ago or so, and that's a useful technique. Yeah, so if, if I have a, a tricky algorithm which has all sorts of optimizations, then, then I will absolutely uh, write the naive algorithm, which runs much more slowly, but I know produces the right answer. And then in test code, you can simply run them both and compare the results. So I, I've done that, but it, it wasn't part of this kind of property-based uh, effort. Ray. You talk about uh, doing statistical mitigation. Uh, uh, how, uh, did, did, did you see, when you were developing this, lots of false positives? <coughs> have to like, up the ante on that kind of stuff? Or? So the question is, I talked about statistical mitigation briefly. Did, did I see uh, the need for that in testing? Um, it, it depends. I first implemented this, um, like I said, in an in a, in a environment where I didn't have access to a, a fast, uh, accurate, high-frequency clock. Or, well, I, I had to use RDTSC, in fact, but I didn't have a standards-based one. Um, and the interaction, I found that on different platforms, the, the performance of the, the, you know, the actual function you call to get the high frequency clock, depending on what your algorithm is and how finely you try and divide, you know, it's the old problem of if you're trying to profile something, the time you take to call the clock function actually interferes with the profiling. Right. Um, so I had, I had in particular some concerns about uh, the first run of the algorithm 
being slower than the cache warmed runs after that. Um, as to how that plays out in practice, for, for the actual, uh, for the actual uh, use cases I had for Battle.net, uh, the algorithms were complex enough that they, the speed of them dwarfed, dwarfed that pretty much. Um, but I've certainly seen that in my test cases. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you really want to do proper, if you really want to look at multiple samples for your timing properly, you shouldn't just be taking five samples and dividing them. Uh, yeah, look, yeah. You, know, you need to look at confidence in those and you need to figure out what sample size is sufficient. It's true. So the comment is, I'm not a statistician, and that's totally, <laughs> that's totally, that's totally true. I accept that. Um, okay. So since we have some time left. Uh, I have some slides and some interesting stuff I discovered when trying to interact this with, with tuples in particular, which I thought might be useful for this audience. So, of course, people are never satisfied. The first thing they ask me is, oh, that's cool. Can you do multiple arguments? And so for ages I told them no, but then I thought, well, maybe I can. Um, so how would they do multiple arguments? I thought, well, the macro obviously becomes, you know, so here we have multiple arguments, let's say. The macro becomes a var arg macro. And that means then that um, we have this multiple argument operator paren, right? And so we need some way to pull out all the arguments in our function traits uh, template. And so how that works is by using a tuple of arguments, right? And uh, <coughs> this apply and unpack apply are very, you know, basically identical to the apply that is in um, the, the current, what is it, C++ or the library fundamentals TS? TS. Um, except they don't do the, the perfect forwarding because the mechanism of the framework doesn't actually ever pass in our values. It, um, but yeah, so, so the, the tuple type here is just uh, decaying all the types in the, in, the, in the function signature. And then once I kind of did this, then I had to figure out how to write shrink for tuples. So right, so that, that's just that which I assume you've already followed. So that's <coughs> so I need to write shrink for tuples. So I started thinking about that, and of course I started first thinking about how to write shrink for pairs. I had a kind of you know a, a, a version of shrink for pairs that that I'd written very quickly, and I was aware I didn't do the right thing, and kind of marked to do in my head to come back. So I thought about with a pair you can either shrink the first thing or the second thing, and you can you can do the Cartesian product of the vectors with the first thing shrunk and the second thing shrunk. Uh, or you can do just the, the appending of the vectors. Um, so I started wondering about um, that kind of thing. And uh, I thought about doing the Cartesian product. Um, and at the time, I, you know, I'm a student of Haskell, and I was sort of learning about you know, this is how applicative works on list in Haskell. Um, but it struck me that the way that the algorithm works to find the minimal case, it can work without the Cartesian product of the shrinkage. It can work just with the shrinking the first thing and then shrinking the second thing because it would basically just, the shrink would basically just shrink the fir uh, uh, go down the first branch until it found that and then shrinking it would go down the second branch uh, in the case of a pair. Could you do something like a design of experiment and just have it, instead of doing the full Cartesian coordinate, pull out, figure out the subset to run instead? Uh, the question was, instead of doing the full Cartesian product, could I figure out a subset to run? The uh, design of the experiment is, is often the way they use it when doing uh, life science projects and stuff, when you have multiple uh, variables. OK, I'm not familiar with that technique. <coughs> sure. Um, so, so when you're shrinking pairs, um, all, all you need to do, well, all I do, is um, so shrink the first. Uh, so I'm returning a vector of pairs, of course, that will be shrunk. And that vector is going to contain a bunch, of, a bunch of pairs where the first thing is shrunk, and then a bunch of, bunch, bunch of pairs where the first thing is the original first thing, and uh, the second thing is shrunk. So that's. That's fine for pairs, and that worked well. So now from, I went from pairs to tuples. So I was fairly new to tuples, so of course I went to cppreference.com, and I looked at um, what was available for me in the library to work with tuples, and I found these things. So make tuple, no, I didn't, 
that wasn't what I needed. Tie, very useful, but not what I needed. And I looked through and I saw Tuple Cat. And I, you know, this kind of tweaked my kind of functional programmer brain. And I thought, that's weird. Why do they have Tuple Cat and not Tuple Cons and Tuple Tail? And, what, and maybe what I need is Tuple Cons and Tuple Tail. So, and, and Tuple, you know, and Tuple Head. Um, so we have tuple head, which is just std get of zero. Um, tuple tail I needed to write, and make pair is, for, is basically tuple cons. Uh, and, well, make pair for pairs is the equivalent of tuple cons for tuples. <coughs> so I thought, well, I'll just pretend these functions exist so I can write shrink for tuples. Um, and so this is what shrink for tuples looks like. Um, you shrink the head. Uh, so you have, you're returning a vector of tuples. Right? And, and to start with, you are shrinking the head and consing the shrunken heads onto the tail. Shrunken heads. And then, <laughs> and then you shrink the tail uh, recursively. Right? So you, ca you call uh, shrink on the tail of your tuple to, to get it in, and then you cons it together with your original head. So uh, this pretending that tuple tail and tuple cons exist allowed me to write this function. Um, and then all I had to do was write tuple cons and tuple tail. So tuple cons is really easy. Um, all it does is call make tuple with the new thing and the forwarded old tuple, right? Quick question. Yeah. Tuple cat do a superset of tuple cons? Uh, yes. And I was using tuple cat originally for tuple cons, but Something that does a superset of something is not nice for a functional programmer. I want to use, <laughs> I want to use the least powerful things I can. So it kind of offended me a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> uh, yeah, but it's totally true that you could you could make a tuple of one element and call tuple cat with with the tuple, your then tuple of your head tuple of one element and your your tail tuple. Uh, and tuple tail is uh, also quite simple to write. So all tuple tail is is um, making the index sequence and offsetting it by one uh, in the call to make tuple, and then, uh, or rather, offsetting it by uh, let's see, taking the length of the tuple minus one, right, the size of the tuple minus one, and then calling make tuple with that offset by one. Any questions? <coughs> so this, this, I thought this was interesting to show this group because I think, it, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of what's possible with tuples and applying functions. <coughs> and when you, you know, this really struck me that um, when you mix tuples and variadic templates and index sequence, you get quite a lot of power out of it. Yeah. Uh, the question is, when when I'm shrinking, I'm walking down kind of in the Cartesian space. If we think of a Cartesian space of the shrinkage, I'm walking down the diagonal. Uh, and would it be useful to think about exploring the the extents of that space rather than just walking the diagonal? Is that right? Really the, corners, the, right? the corners, because the corners are maybe where the interesting edge cases happen. Uh, yes, you're right. Maybe they are. Maybe I should do that. Um, I don't think I'm walking the diagonal. I think I'm actually walking the two sides because I'm shrinking one and then shrinking the other. So it's a gradient. So there's still work I have to do in this space, and I'd be really. That's a conjugate gradient. <coughs> yeah, th this is th this is stuff that I've haven't had a lot of time to think about, and and I'd be really grateful for anyone in the audience who has ideas. A fairly simple tool is you've got a test case that you generate that was from the random fuzzing that was larger than you wanted. So you're trying to narrow down a simple version of that one test case rather than find a bunch of right. test space, 
test in the space. So this seems actually to me the correct simplest way to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, otherwise you enter the fine world of multidimensional optimization. Yes. Where you yeah. need something <coughs> like continuous functions which the program <coughs> never will be. Right. The idea of walking the space would be more appropriate for the initial problem of how do I test the big yeah. thing. Right. Mm -hmm. True. right. So the comment was that um, maybe this uh, simplistic way of walking the space is what's needed uh, in this case to be the right tool for the job. Uh, so, so yeah, so that's how shrinking progresses. We, we shrink the heads and cons the shrunken heads onto normal tail, and then shrink the tail and cons the shrunken tails onto the normal head. <laughs> um, so that's the end of my bonus slides. If there are any more questions, I'd be glad to take them. Um, otherwise, there is, there is um, code, a library of sorts that you can look at, and thank you for listening.